Welcome to Gladwin Free Methodist Church. Here's Pastor Phil Hardup with Living in Love, Forgiveness, and Acceptance. This morning, I hope you brought your Bibles. If you, if you uh, need a Bible, there's one in front of you in the pew. It's red or green. There's some green ones around, too. Um, open them to the Gospel of Luke to begin. In the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and then Luke, and go over to chapter 7. Father, I thank you for meeting with us today. Lord, I've, um, I've thought about and I've prayed about this message. And Lord, I've, um, I pray that you would help me to communicate what is of you today. Lord, I have sometimes my own thoughts and ideas, but Lord, I want them to be in harmony with what is scriptural. And Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would have freedom to work in my life, that you would have freedom to work in each life that is here, that the truth of the cross would be the only thing that makes sense to any of us this day. And I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I really appreciate Pastor Steve sharing with us last week from the Song of Songs. I appreciate it because marriage is so sacred. I appreciate it because marriage is supposed to be beautiful. It is holy. It is part of God's design. It's his intent that, that we walk in this perfect Relationship, it's perfect because we're surrendered to Christ, that we walk in relationship with God, and he blesses us as husband and wife are committed to following Christ. There's this opportunity for this wonderful relationship that is as God intended. And I was reminded that our marriages should always reflect Christ, that we should guard them, that we should protect them. Today I want to continue to talk to you about our relationship with the Lord Jesus and how our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ should have an impact on the world around us. At the Gladwin Free Methodist Church, we affirm our mission often. We say we are on this mission to help people find a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And when they find that relationship with Jesus Christ, they will also be able to grow in that and grow in that relationship to the point where they can share that with other people, helping them know what it means to follow Christ as they have learned to follow Christ. We know that Jesus called us to be, to be his followers who make disciples. In other words, to be a student of Christ who is helping others know what it is to be a student of Christ, who walks closely to Christ. You know, in, in the Bible where it talks about a teacher, a rabbi, Jesus having disciples, when they would talk about disciples, they would they had a picture that a disciple was someone who walked so close to Jesus, they literally got the dust from his footsteps on them. I want to be a disciple of Christ that walks close to Jesus. I think about a little boy following his, his father and trying to walk close to him, and where, where he's so close, the father turns around and he almost trips over him. I want to follow Jesus that way. I want to be that kind of follower, but I know in my walk I have not always been that kind of follower of Christ. I read, anyone watched any of the news the last couple of weeks? I, I, I know you have, you don't have to raise your hand, it's hard to avoid. I see some things, and, and, I, and I see some things people talk about, and it breaks my heart. I read some things or I hear some stories and I think, oh Lord, help us. I, th I hear people talking about not allowing a baby who was intended to be aborted to continue to live because they were born alive. And talking about it in a way that's supposed to somehow make sense to people. I think, Lord, help us. I think about 
the fact that we, we have people talking about manipulating um, gender at the whim, listening to some human thinking that's been that's coming from clearly a wrong place. I think about the fact that uh, we hear about these things and we know that suicide rates continue to rise. We know that pornography continues to be rampant. We know that hate groups are a reality and they continue to grow. And all the while we hear people saying we need to be embracing more tolerance, but that tolerance seems to be I'm tolerant as long as you agree with me kind of tolerance. But I think about those things, and then I'm reminded, we have not invented any new sins. We are not living in a time that is without hope. And I'm reminded that maybe the Lord is helping me as I walk with him to become more aware of the destructive power of sin and our need for a Savior. And I'm also reminded that God is continuing to work that God is indeed on the move and that there are people indeed coming to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. I read stories from our, the church we partner with in, in Jordan and, and the ministries in the Middle East, and I read stories of how people come to Christ, and they have, they have dreams that are very much like the Apostle Paul, some of them, and they will find that in their dreams they are seeing images of Christ and they're coming to know him. God is moving in a world that is hurting. He always has done that, and he always will until his return. I was reading in the book of Acts, and this is why I told you it's good to have your Bible today, because I'm going to move around a little bit. But in the second chapter of Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then Acts in the New Testament. Acts chapter 2, the church is beginning um, his experience in the move of the Holy Spirit, and and the early followers are, are responding to that, and they're beginning to listen to what God has for them. And, and as part of that, Peter stands up, and he begins to address those who are there. And he quotes the prophet Joel. And, and Peter says this, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Peter says, look, in the last days... I'm not going to withhold the Spirit of God from anyone. I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Any who would, who would ask and listen and receive and respond to my call. He says, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. There will be proclamation of who Christ is. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I notice I'm dreaming more lately. Just an observation in my own life. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will prophesy, and they will prophesy, and show wonders, in, and I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. These are days of great hope. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We're living in the midst of opportunity, church. We're living in the midst of an opportunity to lead into the promises of God with everything we have. And it has to begin with you and I positioning ourselves to hear the voice of God. When I see problems, I want to go out and fix them. I want to get involved. I want to jump in. And that's not always bad. But as I'm reading the, the Bible these days, and as I'm praying these days, I keep hearing the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart, and I think he wants us to hear this as a church, saying it's time for you to lean in and really listen. It's time for you to have a season of listening to what I have for you and allowing me to prepare you for what is next, because you can't do this on your own. Before we can run out and do more, we must listen to God's leading. There has to be a willingness in us to allow the Holy Spirit to do a needed work in us, living in love 
as Christ loved, forgiving as Christ forgives, and learning what it really means to be people who accept others. I mean, this won't surprise any of you who know me at all these days. I find myself thinking a lot about healing. <laughs> a lot. This week, Larry Ann will begin her treatments for cancer. I found myself thinking a lot about healing, a lot about miracles. And I spent some time, I was, just, I was looking through the, the Gospels early, ended last week and early this week, and just looking at how Jesus moves and how he works and how he brings healing. You know, when we read, we read in the Bible and we see miracles and we see lives changed by the power of God, I, and I've seen miracles of, of a variety, a variety of kinds of miracles. I've seen physical healings. I've seen spiritual healings. I've seen, I've seen relationships restored. I talked to someone this morning who was experiencing the miracle of God restoring a relationship. We serve a miracle-working God. We serve a God who, who is a God who, who heals. And when we think about healing, when, when I think about healing, sometimes my focus is only on certain aspects of healing. But God moves and brings healing in so many ways. Just at the end of last week, you know, remember... Remember when we were living in the frozen tundra and it was like really, really cold? Um, we were having a little bit of cabin fever in our house, so we went to one of the local restaurants in town. We were at the diner up the road, and there was like barely nobody there because it was cold. <laughs> but that's close to us, so we, we went there. And um, we were sitting at the table, and... You know, I mean, Jesse likes to greet people, right? He probably greeted you today. If he hasn't, he will. <laughs> and um, so we're, we're sitting at the table, and people, as they came in, there was not many. So they would come in, Jesse would get up, and he would greet them, say, hello, and he'd sit back down. And so that this is normal for us. But sometimes in the normal, we're reminded that God is doing something greater than we see. So we're, we're there, we're having our meal, and this lady, moved to tears, comes back and talks to our son. And thanks him and gives him a hug and is encouraged by his heart. I don't know the lady's story. I don't know what's going on in her world at all. I hadn't seen her before. But I knew in that moment that we were experiencing a healing touch from the Lord. We, we, were, we were seeing how a simple act of speaking or caring for someone simply because I know God gave them life and they matter we were seeing that that simple act can bring um, a sense of healing to someone when they need it. I pray that followers of the Lord Jesus would come to a deeper understanding of just how we can be people who promote environments which are healing. You know, what you say, how you respond to people matters so much. And we, we, we miss that sometimes. I miss that sometimes. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. See, I have you move again. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. We are going to get to Luke. Anyway. Matthew, in, in the fourth chapter, in the, in the beginning months of Jesus' ministry, 
just after Jesus had called the first, um, the first uh, four or five disciples, it says this in verse 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria and people brought to him all who, all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds gathered from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. We think about that, and, and sometimes I think about one part of that. And I miss the whole of that. The healing began with Jesus teaching and preaching that the kingdom, about the good news of the kingdom of heaven. The good news of why he came. Jesus' healing always began with the message of who he is and how you can know him. That he came that we might have life and have it to the full. Life that is rooted in the truth of who he is and who we are in him. I see God doing some incredible things. My bride writes a lot. She's a gifted writer. If you be what I write, you would see I'm not a gifted writer. But I, 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 I've listened and I've watched how some people are responding sometimes to what she has written and how God is bringing a spiritual healing sometimes in their life and in that we experience one as well. I don't want to limit what God's doing and how he wants to bring healing in any way, ever. In the Gospels, when we see Jesus moving and interacting with people, and we think about him being a healing God, I was reading some... Uh, um, some thoughts on this that Doug Mirren's written in his book, Churches That Heal, and, and he brought out some good points, and I want to try to, to communicate some of those to you today, but we see in Jesus that he was compassionate, that Jesus cared about the concerns of those around him. Jesus cares about you. He cares about me. He has compassion on you and I. Our concerns are his concerns. We, we live in a world in need of rescue. We live in a world that's broken. We live in a world that's in need of a Savior. I think about when, when Jesus looks at the crowds in Matthew chapter 9. He looks at them and he has compassion on the crowds because he sees them as harassed and helpless in need of a Savior. And he has compassion on them. And Jesus came to bring healing Ultimate healing, Jesus went to the cross for us, right? Why? Because he saw us as helpless, in need of a Savior, lost. Jesus did that willingly for us in his compassion. Jesus knows your needs. Jesus always speaks out toward what destroys life. He rebukes evil. He loves, he loves people. He loves you from wherever you are. He invites all who would to come and to follow him and to have life. Now go over to the Gospel of Luke. 
But don't go to chapter 7 yet. Go to chapter 4 first. <laughs> I told you, I've been looking through a lot of the Gospels this week. Jesus says in Luke chapter 4, he says, verse 18, he quotes scripture. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came that we might know healing. Jesus came that you might be set free. It would be no stretch for me to say that there's someone in this room, someone hearing this message right now, who is, who is captive to something that is not of God. That there's someone here, someone hearing this message, who is, who is really held prisoner by something that is not of God. Habitual sin, an addiction, unhealthy relationship. List could go on and on and on. Refusal to address an issue with anger, a bitter heart, unwillingness to forgive, right? It could go on and on. But Jesus came to set you free. Jesus came to shine the truth that you don't have to live in captive to those things, but you can be set free. Jesus came was anointed by the Father to preach the good news. The good news is there is a way for you to have eternal life, and his name is Jesus Christ. Came to set you free. To help you see truth. Healing always brings glory to the Father. Every interaction Jesus had pointed people to the Father, gave them opportunity to know what it is to be set free, to be forgiven, to walk in his, in his love, to be made whole. Now go to Luke chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 36. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, so he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table when a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume and she stood behind him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. There's a beautiful scene happening, and this, this woman who is, who is moved, understanding that God has done something great for me, is, is expressing her love in this act of worship at the very feet of Jesus. She's she is weeping to the point where she's able to, to wet his feet with her tears. That's a lot of weeping. And the Pharisee is so self-righteous that all he can think of, if Jesus knew what this woman had done, if he knew who she was, he wouldn't allow this to happen. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. <laughs> you ever been praying? You don't have to answer me. I'll answer you. I have. You ever been praying and reading the scriptures? And God says, Phil, I have something to tell you. He hasn't talked to me out in a voice like that, but there are times where it may as well have been. Where the Holy Spirit makes it so clear. Where God says, I'm telling you something, and that usually means there's something I need to address. Jesus says, there's something I need to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owe money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, Jesus said, and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he canceled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. 
You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, You see, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I've entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she has loved for she loved much, but he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. This Pharisee, whose name was Simon, had been paying attention to Jesus' ministry. And in, in fact, a number of Pharisees had been paying attention to Jesus' ministry at this point. Jesus' followers were growing exponentially. His ministry was, every day, more and more people were saying, come and see, come and hear what Jesus is saying. Come and see what he is doing. See what's happening. He was causing quite a stir. And sometimes as Jesus would heal people, as in Luke 5 talks about, he healed, he healed a man who had, who had been lame. Jesus told him, get up and pick up your mat. But before that, he said, so you may know I have the authority to forgive sins. Pick up your mat. How could Jesus say that? He could say that because Jesus is fully God. He had authority. And that challenged many of the Pharisees. Made them uncomfortable. Thought they might lose their position. So Simon invited Jesus to his house. Because he and his other Pharisees and, and friends wanted to, wanted to see if Jesus would have the audacity to forgive more sins. And Simon didn't receive him as a guest of honor. It was customary in those days. I mean, they wore sandals and they walked in dirt. Your feet got dry and cracked. So it was customary when you had a, a guest in your house of, of any kind of honor at all, you would offer them an opportunity to care for their feet and to wash them and clean them. It would be the same like if someone comes to your house, they've been traveling a long time, you offer them things to give them comfort. The restroom, some water, right? Do you need anything before I start, before we have a conversation? We greet them, we might give them a hug. It's customary in Jesus' day to give a kiss on the cheek. Jesus wasn't received at all. And I think about that and I think, we have an important, we say we walk in a relationship with Christ. But boy, we're sure casual about that sometimes. Do we treat our relationship with Christ with honor? With respect? Do we cherish it? Do we care for it? Simon has Jesus there. Wants to have this conversation. This woman comes in and she interrupts everything. God uses her. The Holy Spirit moves on her to interrupt that moment. I think she probably had um, a little bit of anxiety about interrupting dinner. I would have had. Would have had. That's not good, Grandma. I would have. But this is a holy moment. And we don't know her story. We shouldn't, we, the Bible doesn't tell us her story. She just knows that she needs Jesus. She knows that she's experienced a healing touch from Jesus. She wants to worship him. So she acknowledges this need. She acknowledges Christ's love and she's in the midst of this act, and Jesus has this conversation, and he says, and he's talking to the, the Pharisees and all who are there. And he talks about people who owe money. He says, if you owe a huge debt and it's forgiven, aren't you more grateful than the one who owed a small debt? This woman knows that she's been forgiven a great debt, but he who's been forgiven little loves little. Jesus isn't saying that there's this scale 
where some sin is little forgiveness and other sin is great forgiveness. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is there is a need for us to understand that sin keeps me captive. That sin will destroy my life. That living my life in my way, in a way that is only for me and dishonors God and only cares about what's, what, what my pleasure is, what my will is, my way is, will take me where I don't want to be will cost me everything. And Jesus' heart is that the Pharisees would see and desire to know Christ in that way. To know that it is only by the grace of God that I am saved, that I am not righteous. Sometimes we say, uh, we will say, well, I'm a sinner. No, I'm not a sinner anymore either. Christ forgave me. He gave me a new name. But I'm not righteous. I'm made as righteous because of the blood of Christ. You see, when you come to Christ, the blood of Jesus that, that was shed for you covers you. It makes you clean. And when you come to Christ and you seek him and you ask his forgiveness, he forgives you. He washes you clean with his great love. And there's power in that because Jesus rose again from the grave and he lives. He is alive. To forgive is to send one's sins away. <laughs> Jesus sent my sins away. Is he sent yours away? My bride and I have been married over 31 years. It'll be 32 in August. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was just going to get to. Um, over the years, I have done some stupid things. And she chooses not to remember them. You know, sometimes she's a human. She can remember some things. <laughs> but overall... She doesn't choose to bring back my past sins, my past wrongs. Instead, she chooses to affirm me today in whom God is shaping me to be. And I choose to do that in her life. Isn't that awesome? So, so like, she affirmed me the other day. She said, you're a good husband. And I immediately thought, yeah, I don't know. Because I remember, I, re I know, right? We know. Jesus looks at you. If you are washed in the blood of Christ and you're following him, you're pursuing him and you're in, in a right relationship and you're allowing him to shape your life and to teach you, he, he looks at you and he says, you're a good follower of me. You're as righteous because of the blood of Christ. Your, your sin has been, it's, it's gone. It's under the blood. Anyone need to hear that this morning? Anyone need to be reminded of that? You were made new in Christ in the love of Jesus. That's good news, friends. We are called as followers of Christ, as believers, to pray for others and to intercede for them in faith. We are called to, to love them, understanding that there is no one who cannot be touched by the love of God. There is no one who cannot be touched by the love of God. When you see someone, and you will see someone, maybe before the day is out, and you will think, there is no way God can get a hold of them, you need to check yourself and be reminded that God can touch that heart. Do not limit the power of what the Holy Spirit can do in the heart of another. We're called to love people and to pray for them. And acceptance is not, is not laying down um, our right to place judgments on people, our expectations on people. Acceptance is not uh, approval of what is wrong. I'm sorry, I said that all wrong. Acceptance, I told you I'm not a good writer. Acceptance is when we lay down our right to judge others. 
Acceptance is when we lay down our right to have expectations on others. Acceptance is not approving of something that is wrong, but acceptance is understanding that there are people who I need to pray with and walk with and pray for. Acceptance is a willingness when we see someone who is an heir to love them, to be willing to speak hard truths sometimes in love, to affirm them as a child of God and pray for them to be, to be one who would come to know Christ because of our actions. It's a willingness to meet people where they are and to encourage them to grow to the truth of who Christ is and what the cross means in their life. These are days we must lean into the truth of the cross of Christ like we have never done in my time here at GFMC. We need to become hungry for prayer. We do, we do some good things. We do a number of good things. This is why it's important we embrace a season of prayer because we can't accomplish the mission of Christ apart from being surrendered to Him in prayer. And God wants to bless these things, these good things we do, but we have to be motivated to be people of prayer who will listen to God. First Saturday every month we have a time of prayer. It's 8 o'clock on Saturday morning. We don't even need breakfast. We have to do that at home. I choose to fast that morning till it's done. If you're able, I would encourage you to do that as well. But I want to ask you to consider being at the next one. I believe the next one Saturday is March 2nd. I would encourage you to come out. We hear about 20 minutes about prayer and then we pray for about an hour and a half. Let me tell you, it goes by. So God shows up. His Holy Spirit shows up. Every time. Without him. We need to lean into Christ like never before. And I know that there are a number of prayer groups that meet every week throughout the week. And we need to keep doing that. And there needs to become more and more of those. But we do pray about considering allowing this once a month time to become part of what you do. And if you can't protect it from March 2nd, begin to adjust your schedule so you can make that part of what you do. I'm, I'm, I know to the core of my being, the church we need to be leaning into Christ that we never have. Can we stand and we pray together? Father, um, I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you for the way you have encouraged my heart this week. Father, I thank you for the fact that you uh, you bring you bring healing. I know in this room, Lord. Um, Every, in every place I look, I see someone sitting who has been set free by the power of your love, who has been, who has been changed by who you are. I see people in this, who are here in this room today who know that, um, that without certain followers of Christ being obedient and sharing their truth with them, that they, that they might not have come to know you at this point. But Lord, you have been faithful, and you have brought them healing. Lord, I, I think about how in things that we don't we don't choose or plan, how you you use uh, the brokenness of this world, the trouble we walk through. You use those times to reveal yourself. 
and you minister to us. You do give us what we need. Jesus, thank you. Father, as we consider leaning into you, as we consider seeking your face in prayer together, as we consider a monthly prayer celebration as a body of believers, Lord, I pray that you would, that you would find your people willing to lean into you like never before. Jesus, I thank you for meeting with us today. I pray that the words that I've shared this morning would move on hearts. Lord, if there is someone who needs to spend time with you in prayer as the service closes or throughout this day, that they would be obedient to do that. If there are those who need to spend time praying with, with, with uh, myself or Pastor Steve or someone whom they can confide and trust in, I pray that today they would do that. But I pray that you will bless our Sunday school time those who teach, those who serve, those who listen and respond. Lord, make it a time that I need you. And we pray a song in your name.